why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me, let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction. Bring forth an anointing. Let the word heal us this morning. Let the word strengthen us. Let the word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea and in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah, and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem, and the inhabitants there and God's people, and he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming, and second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem, and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith, and this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people, and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing, where his fire fell on the altar, <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged. And there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them where there would be bridges made so that they could uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. <clears throat> These battering rams were going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. They were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. 
They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy, you're going to be humbled to the very dust, you're going to lay prostrate, and the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare, that the devil's going to come. You wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and hits, and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. You don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. He's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver his people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. And that's what he has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, a fine man of God, and just recently he was sued. And... Uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new. There's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we receive uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messages are sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest. And she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me, so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world, people going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord, and he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you'll trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord, and he's going to carry you through. And one day, in his time, every enemy will be gone. And it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> he gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. What you're going through. 
Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says, God will take over. <clears throat> you read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what, a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her, mul- and her munitions and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, the multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying, with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair. And everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you, and the dream will pass, and you will come into his glory. And you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had, and we have all the promises of the New Testament. Yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He has warned us all that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, The closer you walk to Jesus, the hungrier you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is, uh, send us this note. Dear brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. You know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God, they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet 
at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief. For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this, he said, in, in quietness and confidence shall be your security, that you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed. I walked circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your, your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'm going to use something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 30th chapter of Isaiah again. 
You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you, and I will answer you. And he said, I will deliver you, and I'll handle all your enemies. <clears throat> but the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah, did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked, and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private, and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves, and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines, and they sent their ambassadors on swift horses, and they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Chapter 30, uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to uh, go to chapter 30, verse 13, 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest... Shall ye be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength and you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said, the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace. And that's going to be your strength. That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And, whether, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your bridle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow, this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God. 
not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about just trusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up to me and say, Brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, Lord, touch me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial is raging around them and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they've forgotten. And they're on the telephone. They're in panic. They're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded. He's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're then sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen worshiping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed. The posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, Look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel when his own children, having all these promises, turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men? And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever been preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age in my 60s to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on his name and let him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God and not try to defend myself for the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago, before I came to New York, you ever touched me? You came near me. You'll pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touched me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this. But some of you are not there yet. You're still fighting. 
somebody talks about you on the job, start a rumor, you go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through, you're going to sit around. When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on his promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not of me. They've not asked at my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. <clears throat> Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this, and that God tells us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see their ambassadors and their princes? They've got swift horses, and they're all excited. They're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just as swift, and you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over. You turn around, there it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And, you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down. At it, and he says, and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay, you don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no program, there's nothing on the face of the earth is going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit, I resign. You do it, you do it. <clears throat> David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, come on to me now. 
and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it, but oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he was very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. <clears throat> the first message, uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligent I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that he alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to his name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said and I use this very verse, you said, when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And He's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you a shame and a reproach. You turn to the flesh... It ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry. And when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter, uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction? Water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you are being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. 
Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. We'll never, won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still. Don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord, you take it from here. Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, you've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be attempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why he waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. And I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some have only been saved a year or two, maybe. You don't understand. It may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear. Guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling. And I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will. I will. I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. 
He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step, having committed everything to him, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack. You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out of your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God this morning give you a great victory. That He'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right, right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here, that came forward, Holy Spirit just spoke something in my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how, uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel led the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately? The enemy's even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. You might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning. That will never come again. Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. And it reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of his shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against every principality and power of darkness. I'm asking you, Father, to bind and rebuke every lying spirit, every lying spirit that has come against the children of God and those who have been cold and backslidden, those who are going through trials and temptations. You're the great deliverer, and I speak the word of faith right now that you break these chains. Every demon power, you're commanded to depart in Jesus' name and go your way into the abyss. Go your way. Break these chains, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Break this chains. Break the power of these lies. As to what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you is my title. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Now I want to tell you before I start. <clears throat> the Bible said if you, if, you have, if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. You can't be saved without the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you understand that? We've got to fully understand that 
All salvation, all changed hearts is the work of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in hearts. So you can't say, I don't know the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you know the Holy Spirit. You've had his work in your heart. So don't excuse yourself. I, I've preached sometimes on the Holy Spirit. Where people said, well, I don't think I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost like you would describe it, Brother Dave, or, or people in your church. So I think I'll just sit back and relax. That's for spirit, so-called spirit-filled people. Well, I want you to know nobody can get away from this word this afternoon because if you're saved, you have the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Was there any advantage to it? Or has it been to no advantage whatsoever? Heavenly Father, you put this simple, simple message on my heart for the body of Jesus Christ here and Broadway and Times Square Church and for those who may hear it on tape. But I pray for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, come upon me now. Give me a sanctified mind, a clean heart, a pure vessel. Let the words flow from your very heart. Let me be just a channel. Lord, we take your authority over every hindering spirit, over everything that would block the mind and the heart from receiving. Lord, I thank you that through prayer you do speak to your servants. You call shepherds, you call pastors, you call evangelists. Lord, you call us to a certain work. and You've called me to a pastoral message today, and I pray, Lord, that in its simplicity it will find its place in our heart. Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we ask for the unction and the anointing that makes the word life-changing. Don't let it fall to the ground, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? I want you to picture with me for a moment that marvelous scene on the Mount of, of uh, Translation when Jesus is taken up into the heavens. <clears throat> now, these disciples who gathered still don't get it. They still don't understand. They're still shocked and surprised that he's not set up his earthly kingdom here on earth. That's what they thought he came to do, to drive the Romans out of Jerusalem and out of Judea, out of Israel, and set up a kingdom. And they all were going to have a very important place in this kingdom. They're still thinking that way when they stand watching him ready to depart. His closing directions had been to them, tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And you know what they're saying to him? Even though these are his last words, he's about to ascend to the Father and to the glory. And they've just heard that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. And they're still saying, Lord, will thou at this time Restore again the kingdom of Israel. In other words, you are not going to be king. You're not setting up the earthly kingdom, but are you empowering us to do that now? Are we going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be uh, ruler? And they're still thinking, are you setting up your kingdom at this time? They totally missed it. These disciples didn't understand Christ's message that his kingdom was not of this earth. It was a spiritual kingdom. It was set up in the hearts and the minds of individuals, a spiritual kingdom. They're still thinking physical kingdom. They're still thinking Roman soldiers. They're still thinking about taking power and authority in the flesh. Now, Jesus, before he left, gave some wonderful, marvelous promises. Remember, he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I'm giving to you. That's an uh, incredible statement. He said, you haven't known the kind of peace that I'm going to bestow upon you now through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my peace, the peace that has maintained me through my ministry here, the peace I've had all my time as incarnate in the flesh. I'm giving it to you now. And then he says, I I'm going to be with you and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Wonderful promises. But the most wonderful promise of all is that they were going to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, it's important, it's expedient that I go away because if I don't go away, I can only be with a number of you. My kingdom is going to expand. There are going to be millions of you, like the sands of the sea. It's going to be all over the world. I can only be at one place at one time, but it's expedient, it's important that I go and I am going to take of my spirit 
because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. I'm going to take of my Spirit so that I am not going to walk with you. I will not be beside you, but I will be in you. I will be with you. You're going to see me again, but you're going to see me in the inner man. I am going to be poured out upon you, and all the resources that I have are going to be in you. You won't have to come and talk to me. You won't have to walk beside me. I am going to be in you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to come and live in your body. I'm going to live in you. Now, Jesus had spent, what, three years with these disciples and uh, they didn't understand. They were not comprehending. In fact, Jesus says there's many things. If you go to, to John, the 16th chapter, you might just go there and leave it open because I'll be referring to this. Go to John, the 16th chapter, if you will, please. <clears throat> or the 14th chapter. I'm sorry, it is the 16th chapter. John 16th. 14th is good on the Holy Ghost also. I'll be referring to that. But right now, go to the 16th chapter of John, if you will, please. <clears throat> now, let's. Uh, I just want you to read with me, uh, verse, begin at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now look at me, please. This is an amazing statement. Isn't it, isn't it something? Who, who could have been more intimate with Jesus than these disciples? They, they ate with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They slept with him. He taught them many, many things. He, they saw miracles. Uh, he, he told them of the Father. He taught them to pray. Uh, he washed their feet. He told them eternal values. And, and he's saying there's so many things. I, I want you to know so many things I want to teach you, but you can't grasp them. It's not within your power to understand. No matter what I would tell you, no matter how deep I want to take you, you don't have the capacity to understand. You don't even understand the spiritual kingdom. You're not understanding the rudimental, fundamental truths that I'm trying to get into your heart so that you can carry on my kingdom, my spiritual kingdom. But he said, nevertheless, however, there's something going to happen. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. My spirit is going to come upon you. Verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath in mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and will show it unto you. Now look at me, please. Jesus, I, I, I really know in my heart why he could leave them now, and with such joy... Leave them on earth and ascend to his Father and to his former glory. He's leaving with great joy. Can you imagine the anticipation, the joy of our Savior as he's going back to the Father? But you see, Jesus knows what these men face. He knows what his church is going to face. He looked down the corridors of time in his, in his holy mind, and he saw the coming persecutions. He saw all the Roman empires that would destroy multitudes of them. He saw the viciousness of those who thought they'd be doing God a favor by killing his own disciples. He knew they would be beheaded for the sake of the gospel. They would be slandered and maligned. They would be called the scum of the earth. He knew that they would be crucified upside down. He knew there would be despair. He knew all the crisis and the problems his disciples were facing. Yet he could leave them with great joy and expectancy because he knew he knew that he was leaving. He was sending 
the Holy Ghost, who would have all the resources that they would ever need, all the power, all the glory, all the might that they had, every resource as if Jesus walked side by side with them, lived in their house, slept with them, walked with them, talked with them. They would have all the resources that were in Christ. He says, all things that the Father hath in mind, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He will have resident in him every resource that is in me. As the son of the living God, these resources are going to be in you. You may not be able, I may not deliver you from being beheaded. You may lose, take the spoiling of your goods, your house, your family may be taken from you. But I am going to have in you such a spirit of grace and such power that you will not fold up. You will not have to give in. You will not have to uh, die in despair because I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace to face any situation, any crisis, financial, physical, spiritual, mental. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. <clears throat> Beloved, the disciples had the law of Moses. They, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the Psalms. They had the prophets. <clears throat> and yet they do not understand. They are not comprehending. They're not grasping. Jesus is saying, and they had Christ who is the living word. And even though they had the living word, they were not comprehending. And, and the Lord seems to say, I'm not going to take you any further than this. There's something more that's needed. Folks, I want to tell you, I want to make a statement and hear it, and hear it well in your inner man. This word, this word of God is a living word, but it cannot be comprehended. It cannot be understood without the work and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has to bring it to life. The Holy Spirit is, is, we, we say the letter killer. That's speaking of the law of Moses. It's not that this scripture is a dead book. This book is full of life. But for you and I to understand it, the life that's in it, to be uh, injected into us, that we be begin to comprehend it, it's because we must have, we need the Holy Ghost to open our eyes. I, I have heard ministers preach sermons that were theologically very correct, the man very serious, the word preached with with uh, fervor and sincerity, and it's very evident the man has done his study and his homework. He's, he's had his theological background. He gets up, and the word sounds good. It's proper, but it doesn't move you. It, 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 I, I said, well, that, that was all right, but it didn't do anything for me. It didn't change me. It didn't stick with me because it was not under the unction. It did not have with it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I have pastors write to me almost weekly. Confessions. One dear, uh, I was going to name the denomination, I won't name it. But this dear pastor wrote to me a loving letter. He, he said, Brother Dave, I feel like I'm just an empty uh, echo in the pulpit. He said, I study, I pray, I seek the Lord, I am sincere. And I get up and the words just seem to fall right down in front of me. There's no light. There's no power. It, it, it doesn't even affect me. I'm just saying words I hear echo out of my mouth. And folks, the reason for that is because the man has not been, he has not been moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has not been under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make that word come to life. Only life produces life. If there's death in me, I can't give you life. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, if I'm not walking and living in the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not receiving the word from the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to change you. It's not going to change anybody. It's going to be the dead ladder. We must have the Holy Spirit to understand and even to live the word of God. Many things they could not understand, but the moment the Holy Ghost came upon them, they understood it. Peter could stand and preach with, with an understanding that just absolutely opened up. Suddenly the lights were turned on. Suddenly he understood what Jesus had been saying all these months that he'd been with him. The understanding was opened. Hallelujah. 
He is the spirit of truth. The scripture said he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, beloved, my message is not complicated at all. I simply want to uh, persuade you this afternoon how very personal the giving of the Holy Spirit is, how very personal it is. <clears throat> Most Christians do not know the Holy Spirit in an intimate, personal way. They talk about being intimate with Jesus, but they do not know what it means to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be intimate with Jesus without the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the intimacy. He's the way maker into the intimacy of Christ. He doesn't speak of himself. He speaks of Christ. He opens Christ. He brings to remembrance everything about Christ. How can you be intimate with Jesus without being very intimate with the Holy Ghost? To, to most Christians, the Holy Ghost is like a cosmic, impersonal atmosphere who wastes around in and out of your life. It's like a perfume, sweet perfume that comes and goes. If you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, he's gone. But he, they, they, they see him, he is a spirit, but they, they, he is also the third person of the Godhead. He has a personality. And he lives in places. And folks, this is the place he lives, in our temple. It's called the temple of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> to what purpose? Was the Holy Ghost given to you? And to what advantage in your life? Many who claim to be in and of the Spirit have really had no real effect. They live like other people. They, some, they, they have as much wretchedness and miserableness as anyone else on the job. They go to church and they don't understand. They're just as dead as anybody else. And they claim to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I ask you to what advantage? That's the purpose of my message. It's true that most Christians believe that he's doing a great work in the earth. You know, that he has come to reprove the world, the great big globe. He's come to the planet to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And they're not a Christian anywhere who doesn't believe the Holy Ghost is at work in Manchuria, in little villages, the Holy Ghost is moving in little towns and mountain villages and, and some most innocent uh, little Christians are having great revivals in Manchuria. We believe that God is moving in Afghanistan in those little village churches, in the little hideaways. We believe that the Holy Ghost is working in India and in China, thousands and even millions being converted. We We believe that He's in Iraq right now. I know the Holy Ghost is in Iraq. If you've just been listening to the news, Saddam's own son, uh, son-in-law has just escaped and three other members of that so-called royal family and they say they escaped because they're going to bring Saddam down. The Holy Ghost just moved in there, blew him out and God's changed. God, the Holy Ghost is in charge of all the kingdoms of the earth. You know that. You know what some people don't understand? Oh, I'm so glad the Lord taught me every war, everything that's happening on the globe right now has to do with God's eternal interest with his church. Everything. See, God, God moves nations. He moves presidents. He moves kings just to take care of his little flock. Everything that's happening has to do with God's spirit with his flock. All these world leaders getting together thinking, what are we going to do? And why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? They don't understand why they're doing it. It's all God is mo moving and manipulating and planning because he's protecting his bride. Every war, every major happening on the face of this earth is the Holy Ghost taking care of his bride. <coughs> now, we, we know... In 1973, there was a lady named Norma McCorvey. She became the symbolic plaintiff in the abortion rights case. Roe versus Wade, remember? She, she was, she was the Jane Roe. Did you see the papers today? She got saved. <laughs> she was walking 
uh, past the playground. And the playground was empty. And there were three or four swings. And they were just swinging in the wind. And there were no children. And, and, and terror struck her heart. She said, they're killing all the children. No children in the playgrounds. The Spirit of God came on her. And she was led to Christ. And now she's joined the fight against abortion. Amazing. The Holy Ghost. Oh, see how we marvel at the work of the Holy Ghost in the world? Oh, she, Madeline Mary O'Hara. She was the one who successfully drove prayer out of our American schools. President of the uh, Atheist Society of America. But the Holy Ghost, she couldn't keep the Holy Ghost out of her own house. Holy Ghost went in her own house, saved her son, and he's preaching Christ. <laughs> The Holy Ghost moved into the Kremlin, blew the Kremlin away, pulled down the Iron Curtain. Now he's flooding the Russian front and everybody all over Russia. Bibles are pouring in. Our people are over there right now. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We marvel at that. We see in the wonder what the Lord's doing in, in the world. But folks, we are missing the personality, the, the, the very personalness of the Holy Ghost. He was given to you. He was given to me. He was not just given to the world to come as some impersonal spirit to move on nations and peoples. He was given to you. Listen to what the scripture says. How clear the comforter will come unto you. The father will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You will know him. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you. He will show you things to come. I will send him unto you. You. Until you grasp that. The Holy Ghost is at work in the world, but he's mine. He is mine. He's my guide. He's my teacher. He's my comforter. He's in me. In John's revelation, all seven churches of Asia were birthed by the Holy Spirit. They're living in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost speaking through John to the churches of Asia. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to these churches because it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's the Spirit speaking through the pen of John. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit saw in the churches. Loss of first love, a church falling into lethargy, false doctrines creeping in, fornication, all forms of idolatry, seductive Jezebel teachings, adultery, deadness, empty forms of worship, loss of power, spiritual blindness, lukewarmness, loss of communion with Christ, wretchedness, misery. Do you have ears to hear the the Spirit on three occasions says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying? You read all this, but do you stop and hear the inner man? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? He's speaking to us. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He's saying the same thing he's saying to us. I've been sent to every one of these. He was sent to every one of these Asian churches. He was sent to every believer in those Asian churches with all the wisdom, the knowledge, the power, the resources that are in Christ. They were in him. He said, I have been sent to do all things and perform all things as surely as if Christ walked with you on this earth. Why then? Is it, why are God's people leaving their first love? If he's come to lead us into all truth, why is the Laodicean church in such blindness? If he has come to give us the riches of Christ, why are they poor? Why are they wretched? If with the mind of Christ is in us through the Holy Ghost, where is the power? Why is John seeing him, the one who laid his head on his bosom? His dear friend, why does he see him now come at walking among the seven candlesticks, which were the seven churches of Asia? And why are his eyes blazing? And why is there a sharp word, a two-edged tongue, a sword pouring out of his mouth, speaking at the church with fire and thunder? And what is he saying? What is he saying? These seductive teachings and the wretchedness and the misery and the poverty. Now, 
Let me ask you a question. What if Jesus had delayed his crucifixion just long enough to minister for three years in these Asian churches? He, he delayed his crucifixion. He delayed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he travels, did Paul, to all these seven churches. And he, he gave the living word. He was the word and he expounded to them. And he, he made visit after visit after visit to these seven churches. Would they have been any different? No. The scripture makes it very clear. He would have had to have ended his time with them. And he was saying, there were so many things I wanted to tell you, but you can't grasp them. They needed the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit. But to what advantage? To what advantage? They had the Holy Spirit. Why did they end up in such a sad state? Why is there such incredible blindness? Christians so deceived that they thought they were near perfect. When they were absolutely deceived, they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is what the Holy Spirit's wanting to know. That's what he's asking. How is it with all the resources available? How is it that you can say that you walk and live in the Holy Spirit and you live in such poverty? You walk in such blindness. Here's Jesus saying to the seven churches, he's saying, repent, or I'll remove your candlestick. In other words, I, I'll take away your reason for existence. You won't even be called to church. He says to another, repent, or else I'll come unto you quickly, and I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Another, he says, I'll send you into great tribulation. Another, I'll spew out of my mouth. It, did the Spirit speaking... Through John's pen, have a right to speak so sharply to his own spirit-filled people. Very. Why, why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here in the first three chapters of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? Why such grief in the Holy Spirit? Why such threats to his own church? <coughs> Lovingly, yes. Because even the Laodicean church, you know, when it says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, God wasn't eating his church. Please understand, he wasn't chewing up his church. He's not trying to digest his church. When it says in his mouth means, you know, what comes out of his mouth, two-edged sword, it's the word that is in his mouth. He's talking about people who once were in the word. He said, I'm going to spew you out. There'll be no understanding. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no discernment. He's not sending them to hell. He's not damning his people. What he, what he is saying, because in the next few verses, you say he's knocking at the door. He said, buy of me. He's knocking at the door. He's longing to come in and sup with them. He loves them dearly. There's so many being spewed out of his mouth. They're living without. that. That's why so many of these manifestations that are foolish are coming into the church. They've been spewed out of the mouth of God. The two-edged sword is there no longer. They're not walking in the power of the two-edged sword. They're not walking in the spirit of his mouth. Why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here? I kept thinking, God, why are you so grieved? Why is it, it, are you speaking so sharply to the church? It's the same reason he is grieved about many of us in this church. I have grieved him in this matter. The Holy Spirit is sharply grieved with some of us sitting here right now hearing me. Here it is. They had all the is in the power of the Holy Spirit available, and they ignored him, they hamstrung him, and they went their own way, seeking their own counsel from crisis to crisis to crisis. They endured their blindness, they endured their emptiness, they endured their misery, they went from misery to misery, crisis to crisis, and did not call on the Holy Ghost, did not use him. They abandoned his power. They ignored his power. Very few Christians, when they get in trouble and when they're hard places, run, com run immediately to the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, I had a picture in my mind coming to church uh, just before this service in my house. I picture in a big crusade, a great big bowl, 20,000 people or so in this big uh, 
amphitheater, and there's a great evangelist there who advertises himself a man of power, full of the Holy Ghost and light. And we've got all 20,000 eyes waiting to see the Holy Ghost do something through one man. They're all waiting to see. All on the edge of their seat, excited. Folks, and I'm not putting this down. But they're all looking down there to watch what the Holy Ghost is doing. You know what I saw? I saw the Holy Ghost down here on stage looking up at 20,000 people. Watch and see, well, what are they going to do now? Uh, are they going to tomorrow see it's just as important that I help them in their argument with their boss? And when they're leaving the house in the morning and things are all wrong, they turn to me and get grace and power for the day. Where are the 20,000 miracles on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday out there? They're looking at this one man, the Holy Ghost, looking at 20,000 people saying, I want to see not hear one man. Folks, it's not enough to come and say, that was a Holy Ghost meeting. What about a Holy Ghost wake up in the morning? What about a Holy Ghost subway ride? What about a Holy Ghost lunch? What about a Holy Ghost coming home, take your wife in your arms, and a Holy Ghost kiss? And the Holy Ghost moving all day long. What's wrong with that? Why else would such an ed educated, prosperous, gifted churches in Laodicea end up with so many rich and miserable, poor, blind, naked believers? How could it be but that they had ignored and not consulted and not appropriated the great power in the ministry of the Holy Ghost? And folks, that is what grieves the Holy Spirit today about you and me. That, that, that we do not appropriate this power. We're, we're looking for counselors. Some of you people are still paying $100, $200, 500000 getting on TWA, going here, going there to get a word from somebody. Somebody lay you down and pop you. I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, when are you going to depend on the Holy Ghost yourself and not look for some man? We've got a problem in the church, folks. It's a big problem. We've got an ironclad covenant of the Holy Ghost that he has come to abide. He doesn't flit in and out. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We may make him grieve. We may make him weep. But he said, I'm with you. I am with you till you die. I'm with you. I will minister to you. I'll minister to you. I'm available. Call upon me. But why so many so-called spirit-filled Christians walking in utter confusion. Do you know what pastors tell me? That, 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 uh, that there, there are people are coming to them and saying, what's happening? We, we don't understand what's happening in all these manifestations. There's such confusion in the churches today. Thousands of Christians confused. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. You know what's wrong with that whole scene? Is that they have not been shut in with the Holy Ghost they don't believe that He is their guide, that He will guide them, He will teach them, He will show them. If they'll just spend quality time with Him, they'll know it in the inner man. Nobody has to tell them. The Holy Ghost will tell you. It's not enough to say I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I can speak with tongues and I can prophesy. I want to hear somebody say, I appropriate Him. I use Him. I use him in my everyday life. I use him every time I get upset. <clears throat> I was just about to tell you how Brother Carter had to use him. When his wife came home and he painted the wrong color in the kitchen. <coughs> <laughs> I've never seen you so red in my life. Okay. How about that color, red? There, there. <laughs> Who 
There, there's not a Christian here in this house this afternoon who, who would not readily acknowledge, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I believe he's my guide. I believe he's my friend. He's my comforter. Folks, that's lip service. We can say that so glibly. And then when we get into a hard place, we are slandered. We have a crisis financially or something else happens. We go to anybody. We run to anybody. We're in a panic. We don't know the rest that remains for the children of God. And I'm telling you, only the Holy Ghost, only relying on the Holy Ghost can bring you into that rest. Why was he given? To what advantage? That in these crises. Now, let me tell you, uh, before I close, I'm not going to preach much longer, but I've got to get to this. I want to talk to you about who grieves the Holy Ghost the most. It's not the mugger. Not the man on the street. It's not the lukewarm Christian. It's not the dead Christian. The one who wounds the Holy Spirit and grieves him the most <clears throat> is the one who has known how to walk in the Holy Spirit and have, through, through exercise, practice, have utilized the Holy Spirit, have found him faithful for years. They have taught the Holy Spirit. They know the Holy Spirit. He said, He's been in, you will know Him. And they have known Him. They have walked with Him. <clears throat> but there comes one battle too much, <clears throat> one slander too vicious, one battle too overpowering, and a weariness sets in. And up to this point, God could point to this man or this woman to, and say to the devil, just like he did for Job, look at Brother Dave, or, or look at Sister McIntyre, look at Brother Brown, whatever the name may be. Look, you see, when they get in trouble, when they're in a crisis, when things go wrong, they immediately run to the Holy Spirit. They immediately draw on his inner strength. They begin to commune with the Holy Ghost. I worked with Sister Catherine Cohen for five years in the car, on the elevator, in, in the restaurants. She was always talking. Half the time, not to me. <laughs> and my wife, she's talking to the Holy Ghost. She's talking to him all the time and not some silly talk. Holy Ghost is not some silly personality. I'll tell you what he's going to talk to you most about, how to grow in Jesus. He's going to tell you how to grow up. He's going to reveal, he'll show you things to come about, things to come in your life about revelation, how he's going to open up your mind and till, till finally the greatest joy in your life is not getting, uh, winning some lottery somewhere. You shouldn't be, you win a lottery. I'll tell you one thing. I was going to say, don't give it here to the church. I'm saying Al because we've got Christians playing numbers and lottery. It, that's gambling. It's out and out gambling. Now you take that for what it's worth, but <clears throat> probably not going to be worth anything to you because you wouldn't win it anyhow. The Lord will see to that. you see there, there, there's a place in the Holy Spirit where you're finally your greatest joy is a revelation of Christ. Something, something sweeter, something more powerful. He opens the word to you. You see things you've never seen before. That becomes more important than money, clothes, cars, human love, anything else. I tell you now. I, I know it. I, I can see it before a holy God. My wife can vouch for this. The greatest joy in my life when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals something fresh about the heart of Jesus. I get ecstasy. I get excited. You can have my car. You can have my... Now, don't take me serious, but... <clears throat> Somebody go and come claim the car. <laughs> Spiritually speaking.
How many know what I mean? You, you say, Holy Spirit, I know you're my guide and I need direction and he will. If you just seek him, it'll come. Isn't it's not going to come? He's not going to send you a fortune cookie with it inside. It's, it's going to come. It's going to come to you in ordinary ways sometimes. You just block a path here, block a path, and suddenly the only doors left is the right one, and that's the only goes leading you. He will lead you in practical ways, but oh, you finally come to this place. <clears throat> the real advantage of the Holy Spirit in being intimate with Him is that I'm allowing Him to do what He's been sent to do. And that's all that it means to walk in the Spirit. Let Him do what he's been sent to do. To lead me into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, it puts a change in your countenance. It, it puts joy in your heart. And you know you can have that on your job. You don't have to be a preacher. He wants that for every one of us. He, he wants you to be able, how be it when he, the spirit truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He's going to show you things about the coming of the Lord. He's going to show you. We're going to see a lot of that tonight. About the coming of the Lord and what he's going to show us. All He shall glorify me. You can be on a job and he'll glorify you right through the, the word and the revelation. He'll receive of mine and he'll show it unto you. And Brother Carter was talking about taking a little Bible into to a little cubby hole somewhere on the job and reading it and somebody's going to hear a screech and a scream. You know what it is? God spoke to you, a revelation. You come out of there smiling and everybody says, well, they won the lottery. They won the $300 ticket. Uh, something wonderful's happened. No revelation of the Holy Spirit has come. Revelation. Walking and living and moving in the revelation of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to preach it. It's something that you get from your own heart and you ponder it. You don't go around boasting about it, but it's bringing life to your spirit, bringing life to your body and your soul. Hallelujah. Well, I better quit. <laughs> to what advantage is the Holy Spirit that has been given to you are you leaning on him? Oh, folks, I talk to him every waking hour. Wake up in the middle of the night, I talk to him. Now I'm in trouble, I call on him. Where is he? He's not out there. In China, so busy, he doesn't have any power and time for you. No, 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 no. He can take care of the whole world and still count every hair on your head. <clears throat> if you're bald, every follicle, he can, <laughs> he can do it. His thoughts are so many towards you, you can't comprehend them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you have the Holy Ghost? Let's stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of you fellows from Timothy House know you can walk every single day in the power of the Holy Ghost? Direction, anointing, comfort, strength. Power, everything you need is in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this church. You are welcome in this vessel. This is your temple. This is your body. Lord, we've got to start showing the advantage of our walk with you. There has to be an advantage. You were given, Lord, to meet every need. Oh, meet every need here. Holy Spirit, meet every need. Hallelujah. Lord, for those that are hungry, Holy Ghost has enough food to fill every hungry spot. He can fill every belly. Hallelujah. Every sadness you can drive away and restore gladness. Oh, God, for every wretchedness, every blind eye, you can open them. You can give wisdom and knowledge and truth. It's all in you. Hallelujah. All that is in Christ has been deposited in the Holy Spirit and deposited into our very physical bodies. Not just our spiritual mind, but into our physical bodies so that we can be...